Good morning. morning. My name is Donald. I'm one of the associate pastors here at First Alliance, and what a privilege it is to stand before you today. I want to thank you for your prayers, especially as you pray that the Lord will not, I'll cause you to not so much hear me, but to hear his voice today. For it is his voice that we need. It is a privilege to share God's word with you. And I pray that you will indeed be blessed. Then God said, then God said, nine times in Genesis chapter one, we find this phrase, then God said. Connect with each occurrence of that phrase, we either have an opportunity to see what took place in response to what God said, or we simply find the words, and it was so. Heaven and earth came into being because God spoke them into existence. The Bible teaches that in the speaking of God, there is inherently divine authority and power. How did Jesus calm the raging storm? He simply spoke and said, peace, be still. There was a display of divine authority and power. The Bible is the book of the ages because God's word has existed from all eternity. Forever, O Lord, says the psalmist, your word is firmly fixed in heaven. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You have established the earth and it stands fast. By your appointment, they stand this day for all things are your servants. Satan in the Garden of Eden, attacked God's word. And ever since that time, men, atheists, agnostics, philosophers, naysayers, scientists, scoffers, and people from all walks of life have twisted it, have ignored it, have disobeyed it, have tried to suppress it. But Jesus said, being the Son of God, in Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. The Apostle Peter speaks about our salvation standing on the eternal word of God in 1 Peter 1, verses 23 through 25, You have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. All flesh is like grass, and all glory, or all its glory, like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of God abides forever. And this word is the good news which was preached to you. Our lesson today is taken from Joshua chapter 1. And there should, there you go. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. God says to Joshua, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous. And then you will have good success. Joshua was a learned man. He was a man who was skilled in warfare. And yet we find God saying to him, not the words depend on your abilities in war, but this word shall be in your mouth. It shall not depart from your mouth, 
You shall meditate on it day and night. For then you will make your way prosperous. And then you will have good success. And so today's subject is knowing and obeying God's word is fundamental to all true success. Let me say that again. Knowing and obeying God's word is fundamental to all true success. Obedience is the energy that drives the success of God's people. When we think about that word fundamental, we think of things such as important or major. We think of things being central, necessary, essential, vital, and there ought to be a slide up there that says that. Central, necess necessary, essential, vital. And here's why, just a few of the reasons why. The Bible provides nourishment for your soul. Deuteronomy 8.3 Moses says to the people of Israel that God gave you manna in the wilderness that, that you did not know, neither did your fathers know. He humbled you so that you might know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Joshua, or Job rather, says that I, he treasured the words of his mouth more than his necessary food. Jeremiah said that your words became to me a joy and a delight of my heart. 1 Peter 2.2 2 says you, we, we should crave his word like babies crave milk. The next thing is that Bible, the Bible provides light in darkness. The psalmist said your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Peter said in 2 Peter 1.19, we do well to pay attention to the prophetic word as we do to a light in a dark place. The Bible is also powerful in its influence. Jeremiah says it is a devouring flame and a crushing hammer. Ezekiel says it is like a life-giving force Paul says that it is saving power and it is a defensive weapon. The writer of Hebrews says that it is a probing instrument. The Bible will cleanse and purify your life. The psalmist asks, how can a young man cleanse his way or keep his way pure? He said, by guarding it according to your word. Jesus said to the disciples, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. And then he prayed in John chapter 17 to the Father, sanctify them with your truth. And he declared, your word is truth. Ephesians 5.26 talks about that, that Jesus sanctifying the church by the cleansing, by the washing of the word. 1 Peter 1, 22 and 23 says, Since you have obedience, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brothers. Further and they love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed which is imperishable, as I said a moment ago, but imperishable, that it is through the living and enduring word of God. The Bible provides direction for the people of God. For it is by the word of God that we understand that lost people are matter to God and he wants them found. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? It is by God's word that we understand that everything belongs to God. We are his stewards. We are the managers of his resources. Do you believe that? It is by the word of God that we understand that completing the Great Commission will require the mobilization of every fully devoted disciple. Do you believe that? 
Now, now I can be up here all day, you know. So, do do you believe that? It is by God's word that we understand without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, we can accomplish nothing. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Do you believe that? Dependence is the currency of the kingdom. Do you believe that? It is by God's word that we understand that achieving God's purposes means taking faith-filled risks. This always involves change. My, what a testimony Jason gave a little while ago. Taking faith-filled risks. Faith-filled risks. It always involves change. So we start with this. Knowing God's word. Would you please be so kind as to turn someone to want someone and say to them, now that's fundamental. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it every now and then. So glad you so glad you're listening. But you shall meditate on, on it day and night. Jesus repeated the very words of Deuteronomy 8, 3 to the devil in Matthew 4. He says, uh, and see, one of the reasons we know that the Old Testament is authentic is because of the frequency with, with which Jesus quoted from the Old Testament. He used the word of God to defeat the devil. It says after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights. He then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God. Now, now, please understand. Now, the devil was not in question as to whether he was talking to the son of God. So you need to understand what the Greek is really saying. It says, since you are the son of God. He wasn't asking to identify, are you really the son of God? No, he says, since you are the son of God. Turn these stones into bread. But he, that is Jesus, answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Ladies and gentlemen, if Jesus Christ could stand on the word of God, if he could walk by the word of God, if he could talk by the word of God, what about you and me? Knowing God's word. Man, you, what God said to Joshua, he didn't say it to Joshua alone. He also said it to the whole nation of Israel. Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord with your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. How many people here are under the age of 50? Would you raise your hand? Okay, so very likely you have children in the home. That is your first field of ministry. You may be concerned about going out into the streets and, and, and passing out tracts or talking to strangers, but you have a field of ministry in your home. And these words, he says, that I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligent to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You know, I was so proud to see a video clip last fall from uh, showing uh, Luke. And man, you, Luke was not concerned about how often his team won. Yes, did he want his team to win? Yes. But he was more concerned about testifying to the reality of Jesus Christ in his life. Somebody has been doing their job. Teaching the children to love Jesus. Somebody wrote a book some years ago. Why do children, Christian children, grow up in the home and leave the faith? Hmm. I'll let you ponder that. 
Do you call, recall what Jesus said to his disciples in giving the Great Commission? Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Everything that I have commanded you, you teach them to obey and do the same thing. Children do not become Christians just because they grew up in your home. They become Christians as you teach them to know and to love the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. All right. Whatever Jesus commanded us to do, he supplies us with what is needed. In fulfilling the Great Commission, which includes building up the body of Christ, Jesus has made provisions to accomplish this. And Pastor Kurt made mention of this last Sunday. Ephesians 4, 11, 12 says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. God did not call us to be a collection of museum pieces where people come in on, on Sunday morning and see how nice we are. He called us to be broken bread and spilled out wine before a broken and lost world. He called us to be salt and light in a world filled with darkness. He has called us to carry the gospel wherever we go, on the job, in the marketplace, in our neighborhoods, walking down the street, talking over the fence to our neighbor. He's called us to carry the gospel. And you shall talk of it in your house and when you lie down and when you walk by the way. And when you sit in your house, you shall talk of the word. When a man or woman says that they are uncomfortable reaching out to lost people, they're denying the power of Christ within. The prayer in Gethsemane teaches that Jesus didn't go to the cross for you and me because it was comfortable. When Hebrews 12, 2 talks about uh, the joy being set before him and he endured the cross because of it, it was not talking about a picnic. The joy was in doing the Father's will so that through the cross he could bring you and me unto the Father. I need to say that again. The joy... He went to the cross because he wanted to do the Father's will. His joy was in obeying his Father. And in obeying his Father, you and I get to have a permanent relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus went so that we could have that relationship. Jesus desires to live his life in us. We are called to yield ourselves to the power of Christ through the Holy Spirit. He has also made it clear that we should not attempt to do the work of the kingdom in our own wisdom and in our own strength. May I remind you, he says, I am with you even to the end of the age. Jesus doesn't call us to be comfortable. He calls us to walk by faith. Jesus doesn't ask for our abilities. He bestows certain abilities upon us, and then he commands our availability. You can say amen to that. It's true. Do you remember what he said in John 15, 5? And I'll repeat this maybe a couple of times. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. He is the remedy for our inability. He himself is our sufficiency. He said, abide in me and let my words abide in you. Again, for apart from me, you can do nothing the work of making disciples does not happen within our own abilities. How many of you feel that you just don't have enough time to read God's word? I'm so glad you didn't raise your hands to that. Now, I've heard some leaders suggest to their followers and trying to get them, trying to coax them into reading God's word, say, why don't you just try reading 10 or 15 minutes a day? Uh, let me ask you this question once again. Do you believe that knowing and obeying God's word is fundamental to all true success? And by the way, you should not try to measure success according to the world's standards. Our success with God is actually measured by our faithfulness, our obedience, not by what we achieve. 
And so we should stop listening to the lies that says that I don't have enough time. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But do, do you remember, how many of you remember something called the boll weevil? Okay, I grew up in the South on a, on a farm where cotton was the number one uh, product that we raised. And the boll weevil uh, is an insect that was very destructive to the cotton. I mean, it, and it was very prolific in, in its uh, multiplication, and so it would destroy crops. And the scientists wrestled with the idea of how to eradicate this boll weevil out of, through a number of different re means. And in the 1950s, one of the things they came up with was to, to collect a large number of male boll weevils and sterilize them and then release them back into the atmosphere so that when they would mate with the female, nothing would happen. And it worked. Obviously, it wasn't the final remedy, but it worked. They did have to come along and do some other things, but it worked. Releasing those sterile bull weevils back, male bull weevils back into the atmosphere, mating, and they made it, and the crops began to survive. The devil doesn't tell you that you shouldn't read the Bible. He simply fills your life with all sorts of distractions. You're then left with the lie that you just don't have time to read the Bible. Warren Wiersbe said, whatever delights will capture our attention and we will think about it and meditate on it. And this is true of God's word. In the psalm, this is Psalm 119, delighting in the word, loving the word, meditating on the word are found together, and they should be found together in our hearts, even so, in our lives. The devil will never tell you, don't read the Bible. He just make it inconvenient. Only with your cooperation. The second lie is that you can't understand what you read. Now, that just doesn't make sense. Here's why. God says that we're to know his word and we're to obey his word. We're to abide in his word. Why would God give us his word and does not give us the ability to understand it? That's another lie from the devil. What it means is that we simply need to take the time to meditate upon the word and to see exactly what God is saying in his word. And by the way, in this nation, we have access to so many Bible helps that hardly anybody who desires should have an excuse for not understanding what God's word says. That would be an apparent contradiction. Oh, by the way, speaking of contradictions, have you ever heard people say, well, you know, I, I don't really believe the Bible because it is filled with contradictions. Walter Martin says that people don't reject the Bible because the Bible contradicts itself. They reject the Bible because it con contradicts them. People will come trying to find a reason in the Bible to support things that they want to do that they already know is not acceptable to God. And the terrible thing is that when they find something that they can hang on, that they think, which is actually a misinterpretation of the word. The way of the righteous and the wicked is spoken of by the psalmist. Uh, there's a songwriter by the name of Jonathan McReynolds. And I think we played that song sometime last year here right after worship service. His song is entitled Make Room. Uh, the beginning of the word says that I make room for what I treasure. I find time for what I want. I choose my priorities. I make room for what I treasure. I find time for what I want. I choose my priorities. And if you are not reading the word of God, it's simply because you have not made it a priority. You may not have said, well, I'm not going to read the Bible. You simply fill your life with all kinds of distractions 
that keep you from having the time to read the Bible. The psalmist says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of waters that yield its fruit in its season, and its leaf also does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Psalms 119.97 says, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. You know, Jesus came with a mission. And this mission was from the Father. He stated in more than one occasion, but in one instance he says in Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. The Great Commission is the call of those who are Christ's followers to engage in fulfilling that commission. Well, we're not to do this in our own abilities, but we are to abide in him and to have his word abiding us. So knowing and obeying God's word is absolutely fundamental to all true success. In this, we understand that we do not make up our own agenda and present it to God. Jesus has commissioned his body, the church, to finish what he started. We must ask ourselves whether we're living in obedience to Christ's commission. We are what are our priorities? We must be careful to not get sidetracked so that the work of making disciples suffers. There are many good things that the church can do and should do. But what is the priority of the things that the Lord has set for us? We must be careful to focus on the Lord's primary agenda that Jesus has set for his people. Priority number one the great commandment. It's about love, loving Jesus and loving one another. We obey the great commission because we love Jesus. I believe it was Oswald Chambers who said that Jesus never called us to be committed to a cause. He called us to be devoted to himself. Do you remember the lesson from the conversion between, uh, a conversation between Jesus and Peter after the resurrection? He said, Simon, do you love me? Simon, do you love me? It was on the basis of Peter's confession of love for Jesus that Jesus then said to him, feed my lamb, feed my sheep. There's another lesson on priorities. This involves the sisters of Lazarus uh, who are Martha and Mary. And you may recall the story, I'm sure many of you do, where, where Martha was complaining to Jesus that she was doing all of the work and Mary was simply sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to Jesus. And Jesus, in his great love for the both of them, said, Martha, Martha, you're concerned about many things. But one thing is required, and Mary has chosen that one thing. She had built up resentment toward Mary. But Jesus said, you need to abide in me, and my words need to abide in you. My commitment to Jesus drives me to be committed to doing what he tells me to do. If you keep my commandments, says Jesus, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Then he spoke about the disciples' relationship to each other. In verse 12 of, of John 15, he says, This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. Let me say this. Uh, actually, it's a question. In your love for your brothers and sisters, are you guarding the reputation of your brothers and your sisters? St. Augustine said, there are those who love truth when it enlightens them, but hate truth when it accuses them. Are you guarding the reputation of your brothers and your sisters? If I'm committed only to a cause, I may be tempted to try to fulfill the cause in my own wisdom and strength. But if I'm devoted to Christ, then I allow him to do his work through me. Then it ceases to be striving and it turns to abiding. And I desire that all glory go to him. Caution number two. If I'm committed to a cause, 
then when other people do not appear to share the depth of my commitment to my cause, bitter resentment, justice with Martha, may set in. And resentment sets in, the work of making disciples suffers. In fact, without realizing it, our words soon become destructive. Instead of life-giving, instead of our faith community becoming healthy and vibrant, it becomes self-destructive. When you come in on Sunday mornings, and this is a question I ask myself, and I want to ask you as well, how many of you deliberately make an effort to reach out and greet someone new? How many of you make a deliberate effort to smile at someone that you may not have seen for a while? Or even if you saw them last week, I'm determined to show that the person that they are loved. How many of people would become a part of your church family based on the things that you say about your people in your church family? Devotion to Christ keeps my focus on him and doing what he wants me to do for his glory. Priority number two is prayer, and someone is going to be preaching on that uh, real soon. Dependence, as I said a little while ago, is the currency of the kingdom. Jesus said, I do nothing on my own initiative. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if Jesus said that, what about you and me? I do nothing on my own initiative. I always do that which pleases the Father, he says. It is his plan. It is his knowledge, his wisdom, his understanding, his power. Everything Jesus had at his disposal, you and I have at our disposal to fulfill the Great Commission. And so he said, pray the Lord of the harvest that he will send laborers into the harvest. We pray for many things, but we need to make sure that we keep in our prayers praying for the work of commission. The Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Ladies and gentlemen, that is not talking about praying that the government will allow you to be comfortable. He's saying pray so that the government will not interfere without doing the work of the kingdom, is really what he was saying. Pray so that we will be able to go about the business of reaching lost souls without the government interfering with what we are doing in obedience to the Great Commission. He says in verse 3 of that chapter, this is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, we do not have a tribal deity. We don't have a God that is a God of Toledo only. Jesus says, go into all the world and make disciples. You and I have the only, the only message of, of salvation, and that is the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have that, and that requires us. We are obligated to share it. Because without the truth, no one will come to faith in Jesus. Priority number three, make disciples. We exist not for ourselves, but the, for the glory of God. And the fact that we often forget this fact hinders the work of making disciples. The Great Commission is not a great suggestion. Jesus did not call the disciples and says, now I've got this idea, fellas, and I, I wanted to put it to you so that, you know, I want to see what your take might be on it. So I got this great idea. No, no, he didn't say, no, no. It was not a suggestion. It was a commandment. And it is a great commission. I'm near the end. And if the musician would come back up. In the life of the Christian believer, prosperity and success aren't to be measured by the standards of the world, as I said earlier. These blessings are the byproducts of a life devoted to God and his word. If you set out on your own to become prosperous and successful, you may achieve your goal and live to regret it. And whatever man does without God, wrote Scottish novelist George MacDonald, 
he must fail miserably or succeed more miserably. The question God's people need to ask are, number one, did we obey the will of God? Number two, were we empowered by the Spirit of God? Number three, did we serve to the glory of God? If you can answer yes to these questions, then our ministry has been successful in God's eyes, no matter what people may think. Paul said, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearance. A.W. Tozer wrote, it is not mere words that nourish the soul, but God himself. And unless and until the hearers find God in personal experience, they are not the better for having heard the truth. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them in the truth. And he said, your word is the truth. This is far more than memorizing scripture or exegeting scripture or learning doctrine. It is allowing the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, to cause you to love Jesus, the living word, more and more. The more you love Jesus, the less you love sin. The more you love Jesus, the easier it is to obey his word. The more you love Jesus, the more you want others to love him. That combination enables you to walk in obedience to God's word. And we share the gospel, not just to see people saved from hell, but we witness because we want them to fall in love with Jesus. The Bible is not an end in itself, but a means to bring men to an intimate and satisfying knowledge of God, that they may enter into him, that they may delight in his presence, may taste and know the inner sweetness of the very God himself in the core and center of their hearts. Knowing and obeying God's word is fundamental to all true success.